suggested, the sites in Galloway had been recorded pretty thoroughly by various groups of people in previous years. However, the recording had been in an ad hoc way and the scrap project were keen to get all Scottish sites recorded in a consistent, systematic and methodical way. These records were to be put on a database, which they hoped would be a useful aid for further research. Rock art had been a neglected area of study. A throwaway comment by my archeology span tutor many years before had made me interested in rock art, but living in the chalklands of Southern England meant I had not seen any locally. When I asked my tutor what the images were like, he said rather dismissively, only cups and rings. I was unsuccessful in those pre-internet days in finding any images. So I tried to find some when we were on holiday in the north of England. They develop a great art in doing it, and they all did it in their own different ways, which yeah. was great as well too. But if you want to pin them down and see... Alan, can you make sure everybody's muted? Sorry, J Jennifer, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, oh God, I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. I think Helen accidentally muted you. Um, um, do I start again then? No, no, not start again. You've been, you were talking okay until uh, you got as far as not being able to find any images from, from that you're choosing. Oh, the internet, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was unsuccessful in those internet, in pre-internet days in finding any images. So I tried to find some when we were on holiday in the north of England. I'm ashamed to say I did not realize there was any in Scotland outside Kilmartin. I was not very successful. Attempts in Northumberland involved being driven off the moors by midges, whilst an attempt in Cumbria ended with me being taken to a &E with a broken arm. So when I had the chance to search for rock art here, I jumped at the chance. By then, I knew we were in a fantastic place to see rock art. The rock art in Kukubrisha is classed as belonging to the Atlantic Europe tradition. The term Atlantic Europe denotes the land that occurs in the coastal region between the Straits of Gibraltar and the Shetland Islands. It, is, it therefore includes the west of Portugal, northern and western Spain, the western parts of France and Britain and the whole of Ireland and is concerned with those areas where prehistoric populations were linked by water. These areas all have rock art, which is similar to ours. Um, slide please, Helen. In case, 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 case. In case there are any visitors from outside the area, I have included this map to locate the area we should be speaking about. Although rock art is found along both the coast of Wigtownshire and Kukubrishire. This talk is limited to that which is found in Kukubrishire. The local geology consists of grey wacky, locally known as windstone, not the same as the windstone dike upon which Hadrian's Walls is situated, interspersed by volcanic blutons, sills and dikes. The recorded rock art is mostly, but not entirely, found in the improved pasture in the south of the county bordering the estuaries of the Cree and the Dee fleet and along the Solway coast, east of the Dee estuary. In Kukubrisha, we have found that while some of the rock art occurs on small gray wacky knolls situated in the pasture land, some of the panels are on the gray wacky outcrops at ground level and are often quite difficult to find as many of the panels are hidden under thick turf. Many of these panels also have the incorrect grid reference recorded, which makes finding of them even more difficult. Slide, please. Rock art in Kukubrisha seems to be largely unrecorded, though not unknown, until 1882, when Mr. J. Romley Allen recorded two sites in the proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. After that, many sites were recorded and drawn by Fred Coles, W. Thompson, D. Corson, Hamilton, and E.A. Hornell and were recorded in the PSAS 
and the transactions of the Dumfrieshire and Galloway Natural History and Antiquarian Society. Coles remarked in 1892 that until recently, many of the sites were thought to be in a narrow strip of land on either side of the river or near the sea. However, some had now been found at Castle Creevy. Slide please. High Banks was a site much admired by the group. Hornell made a plaster model which now sits outside the Stuartry Museum in Kakubri. Slide please. During the 70s, Ronald Morris studied the rock art in Galloway and produced a book, The Prehistoric Rock Art of Galloway in the Isle of Man. During the 80s, Martin Van Hoyk undertook a lot of good and detailed work in the area. And around this time, there were several other groups recording in the area. During the early 2000s, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland also surveyed some of the clusters. Um, slide, please. The Kakubri volunteers joined those from Wigtown for several days training in the Whitton area. We learnt how to fill in the forms whilst in the field, how to draw the panels in a consistent way, and how to take photographs of photogrammetry. The Kakubri group had to send our photogrammetry photogra photos away to Historic Environment Scotland so they could be made into the 3D models, as none of us had the computer capacity to make them. Rather sadly, the group of rocks in the Maccas upon which we trained have been destroyed. Later, we had another training day at Kirkdale House. Some of the Kirkdale House collection were found under a sundial and probably came originally from the Cardenas estate. The collection now stands in the grounds of a private garden. After training, we were let loose on the rocks of our chosen areas. One group were to record the sites of the Maccas, another the sites around Cairn Holy, which are roughly central and we were going to record those in Kakubrisha. Armed with our wooden spatulas, we were ready to go. At the beginning, we were rather keen and went up to our Grenin Mains, the Park of Tongland, our first site, just after Christmas that year. We soon learned it is impossible to remove deep, frozen and sodden turf with wooden spatulas. They break. Slide, please. Wooden spatulas had to be used as metal implements scratch the rocks and so potentially damage the carvings. We also learned quite early on that it is impossible to record on sheets which have turned into papier mache. Initially, we ended up spending quite a number of aborted recording trips in the Selkirk Arms, eating shortbread and drinking warming beverages in an attempt to thaw out and dry off. The Selkirk were very cool about a group of sodden and muddy volunteers sitting on their clean seats. Despite volunteering for the project for several years, we have many more panels to record. Lockdowns and COVID in the past year have made it virtually impossible to undertake fieldwork and finish off the project, which I'm afraid has, from our point of view, rather petered out, although we have started back now. The panels we have recorded so far are mostly within five kilometres of the coast or D estuary. So far, we have found that although most of the rock art initially appears to be scattered, the panels occur in quite discrete groups. There are, of course, a few exceptions to this. The discrete groups are not easy to visualise when one is in the field approaching sites on different farms and travelling through different winding lanes. Several times we discovered that we were working in an next door field to one we had worked on in the previous year. Slide please. The majority of panels we have recorded occur with extensive vistas over the local hills and coastline of the Solway Firth and Dee Estuary on three sides, but with a more restricted view on the four. To a modern eye, the majority of the prehistoric artists chose to place their work on outcrops with stunning views of the surrounding countryside. Although as the rock art is usually at ground level, the panels would not have been visible to a passerby unless they were virtually standing on top of them or the position of the panels was marked in some way. I can personally attest that prehistoric people seem to have chosen particularly exposed sites. The first time we were able to re remove the soil from the panel at Agrenna Mains, I opened the rucksack 
to pull out the recording sheets, tapes and so on, when the contents of the rucksack were whipped out and blown all over the place. After a lot of chasing around, I think we retrieved everything. But I did wonder if an unsuspecting farmer or walker coming across a random spatula was puzzled as to why it was lying abandoned in the middle of a field. So far, the vast majority of panels we have recorded point either northeast in the direction of Bengen or to the northwest in the direction of Cairn Harrow. In terms of elevation, there appears to be three height bands where the rock art occurs. Generally, the elevation of the rock art increases the further it is from the coast, as geographically, the land around the coast is lower. Modern plantations, woodland and gorse thickets make it difficult to see whether or not the knolls of panels could have been seen from another cluster during prehistoric times. At the time the panels were carved, this area is thought to have been covered by oak woodland, which would have also made it difficult to see things in the distance. But whatever the ground cover, it would have been impossible to see those at ground level unless one was walking downhill and all the panels were exposed and then it may have been impossible. Slide please. There are a few sites record, there are a few sites recorded on Canmore, Historic Environment Scotland's website that are further inland. The sites are still in areas which have improved pasture land, such as a grouping of cut marks at Calton Mains and Drumbeck. The inland areas are more likely to be near the moors where there is evidence of hut circles and strings of burnt mounds following the many streams. Burnt mounds are mounds of charcoal and shattered stones which occur near watercourses. No one quite knows what they were used for, although some suggest sweat bathing, others cooking and feasting, others carcass preparation, others some industrial use. There is historic evidence for deer skinning and cleaning that, which was undertaken in the field, the process involving fires and water. All the recorded panels occur by springs, burns or patches of boggy ground, some of which could have been locks before agricultural improvement. Anyone who goes looking for rock art in Kukubisha will know it is a very wet and muddy process. It would appear from looking at a map and aerial photographs that the inland panels so far unrecorded by us also occur by water. Unfortunately, some of the outcrops which occur on rocky knolls have been subject to historic quarrying. High Banks, for example, was quarried in the early part of the 19th century for building the stained dikes during enclosure. As such, in some places, carved panels can be found in the local dikes. Slide, please. At Castle Creevy, two of the panels are on a dun, one at the top in the middle, the other in the ramparts. The panel on the ramparts appears to be a natural outcrop, whereas the panel in the middle of the dun appears to be on a boulder. Um, slide, please. At Cairn Holy, there are two chambered cairns of the Clyde type. On one of the cairns, there is a cup mark with multiple rings. The cup and ring mark is very weathered and is not easy to see on a casual visit. I think another cup and ring motif, motif has been removed and taken to the National Mu Museum of Scotland. The rock art we have recorded so far, with the exception of those in the New Law Hill area, where the panels are on either very boggy ground and in the recently planted conifer plantations, occur on improved pasture. The odd axe head or hammerstone has been found by farmers in the vicinity of the rock art, such as one found near High Banks, but I do not think any archaeological excavations have been undertaken around the rock panels in the local area. There was going to be some geophysical surveying by HES around some of the rock art sites to see if anything was visible, maybe some areas of burning, maybe some hut circles. Unfortunately, the pandemic prevented this from happening. Um, slide, please. The carvings are on grey wacky, which is a metamorphic rock consisting of clays, which have been subject to high pressure. As such, although grey wacky can laminate fairly easily, it is extremely hard, as anyone with an old house will know. When putting up pictures or hanging baskets, it's quite possible to destroy several masonry bits before the required hole is made. Some clusters have more complex panels on the rocky knolls, which are quite prominent in the landscape. There are, however, many such rocky knolls in the landscape, and most of them do not appear 
to have any carved panels on them. Why were certain knolls chosen or have many more of the knolls carved panels on them which are waiting to be found? This occurs in the clusters near to the coast as well as those to a higher elevation. This may not be the case farther from the coast in the areas we have not yet recorded, which I think from looking at Canmore records have only cut marks on them. The majority of panels which we have recorded have cut marks, cup and ring motifs carved on them, some with cups with single rings, some with multiple rings, but there are other commonly recurring motifs such as rosettes, circles and closing cut marks and others such as at high banks, which as well as the more common motifs has some more unusual ones such as rosettes and mini cups arranged in lines from a central point. Slide please. Grange was one of the earliest, um, I think you've gone on, that's it. What Grange was one of the earliest clusters we have recorded. It is scheduled, although the grid reference given is not where the actual panels occur. Grange has several highly decorated panels, although one is situated in a private garden and therefore cannot be seen. There is another highly decorated panel with several less decorated panels on a rocky knoll. The less decorated panels took some finding as they occur under turf. When we removed the turf for recording, we always replaced it. There is one unusual panel being long and narrow with a row of cut marks and one cup and ring carved on it at some distance from the rest of the group. Um, slide please. The town head cluster has some highly decorated panels. The most famous of the group occurs under the feeder and although we had to remove a lot of partly digested silage and manure with wooden spatulas in order to get to the panel and then replace it after recording it was well worth the effort it is a stunning panel with many different motifs carved on it there are several other decorated panels nearby there were also many other panels recorded in the lower part of the field we had a job finding them as they were also recorded with the wrong grid references. We were working in this field during a particularly dry period and so the areas where there was thin soil on top of the bedrock showed up quite clearly. As the carved panels are usually found where bedrock is fairly near the surface, we thought we'd be able to find the rock art quite quickly and easily. We removed and replaced what seemed to be acres of dry and dusty turf in vain because the highly decorated panels were in a different part of the field altogether. They were also covered by turf, but once we had realized how wrong the grid references were, we were able to find the panels without too much trouble. As the panels were so large and flat, we found that if we were careful, we could pull the turf back fairly easily, although it was too heavy to pull back in one piece. We were surprised as when we pulled back the turf, the pattern of the deeper carvings were replicated in turf in relief on the base of the turf. This made putting the turf back a challenge as we had to get it exactly in the correct place or it did not lie flat. The panels were quite astonishing. They were not perhaps as highly decorated as the under the feeder panel, but were spectacular as we gradually pulled the turf back. When we first removed the turf, the rock was damp and as the surface dried, the carvings stood out quite clearly, then quickly disappeared as the grooves dried out in the hot sun. Um, slide please. The panels were some, had some unusual motifs and areas of carving, as well as having single cup marks, cups with single rings and cups with multiple rings. They had less common motifs, such as rosettes, some very deep and large cups, cups and rings with radials and large rings containing either cups or peck marks. One panel has two motifs carved on it, which look like a child's drawing of apple trees. Martin van Hoyk argues that the occurrence of rosettes, a motif common at Town Head, provides an archeological link between the important rock art sites of the British Isles. He argues that from the evidence gathered at many of the rock art sites throughout the British Isles, one may conclude that the rosette is quite widespread, but occurs in very limited numbers. He goes on to say that there are four areas of marked concentrations of such motifs, namely County Leith, Mid Argyll, North Northumberland 
and Kukubrisha. He argues that the distribution of the rosette, moreover, may indicate the main migrationary routes of prehistoric times, the Louth Galloway Northumberland route and the Donegal Strathclyde East of Scotland route. Van Hoek also suggests that the presence of many differing rosettes in Galicia, which reappear in various parts of Britain and Ireland, provides evidence that these islands were at least influenced from the continent and or vice versa. And he believes that in general, some form of cultural exchange existed between the major rock art sites of Britain, Ireland and the continent. Rather oddly, the Macca's rock art sites seem to specialize in spirals which have only one or and have only one or two sites with rosettes. The Kukubri area does not have many spirals. Slide, please. We were intrigued as to why there were beautifully flat and smooth panels as part of the cluster, which were not used for carving, whilst a nearby panel, which to our eyes looked rougher and more cracked and fissured, had been used. This must indicate that cracks and fissures are integral to the design, maybe as part of their designs or to frame or delineate certain sections. Using natural features and the design of the motifs is called a plastic style. The prehistoric carvers also enlarged natural depressions in the rock surface and used them in their designs. As stated before, the Townhead cluster had been recorded several times by different people. And as such, it was a very complicated area to sort out, especially as the previous recorders had slightly differing descriptions and good references to those we found. It caused us a lot of headaches trying to sort it all out, but in the end, we had to call in the scrap team for their help. Um, slide, please. We were surveying one of the town head panels when a large bull lumbered across and sat in the middle of it. Not a very happy moment for me, as I had been brought up on my grandfather's tales of vicious bulls running amok in the yard. As a result of these stories, I am very nervous around bulls. Rock art site seems to attract cattle, as we also had encounters at sites with curious young stock. It usually involves someone having to fight them off, not literally, I might add, for any farmers who may be listening. But while the rest of the group quickly rushed through the photographs, and measuring parts of the recording process. We found a new, that is unrecorded panel at Milton Parks on the Kukubrisha ranges. But generally, as the rock art in, Kukubri, in the Kukubri area is so well known, it is disappointingly the only one we found. Like the town head panels, this one also had an enlarged cup on it. The cup was surrounded by a ring, so it was definitely incorporated in the design of the panel. Um, slide, please. The panels in the Milton Parks group have a lot of cups with partial rings and arcs carved onto them, as well as the more usual cups and rings and cup and ring motifs. New Law Hill too has arcs and partial rings, but also has a lot of mini cups. Mini cups are the trademark motif at High Banks. Slide, please. High banks consists of several decorated panels with many of the common Kukubri motifs carved on them, such as single cups, cups with multiple rings. However, the iconic main panel has circles of rosettes formed of mini cups surrounding a cup with two rings. Um, slide, please. The most decorated panel of rock art at New Law Hill is surrounded by its own fence and is fairly easy to find if one does not mind getting wet feet. The New Law group are the only ones we recorded which are not in improved pasture. We found several of the less decorated and very weathered panels after a wet walk through very boggy land. We were unable to access some of the sites, however, as they were surrounded by a padlocked deer fence put up to protect newly planted trees. We were unable to find an entry point. Um, slide, please. Two of the three panels recorded at Grenin Mains, Park of Tongland, have just cup marks, while the third has a cup with multiple rings. Um, slide, please. The Balmay group, as a whole, were very weathered, and it was difficult to see the motifs on the panels. 
although they show up well on the photogrammetry 3D models. In several of the panels which we recorded, the motifs were later deemed to be natural features, but one of these panels did have a cup with rings. We could not see it in the field, but it showed up clearly on the photogrammetry image, exactly as recorded by Fred Coles 100 or so years ago. Um, slide, please. Peck marks are dents in the rock left by people hammering, sometimes covering a rock face with little dents or putting them into features like those at Town Head, which are enclosed by a circle. Whereas tool marks are those marks which can be seen in a motif and were left during the making of that feature. On badly weathered sites, these were impossible to see, but both peck and tool marks showed up quite clearly on others. Um, slide, please. The cluster at Craigness Hill, which are very weathered, consists of a highly decorated panel. I'm afraid it's not a very good photograph, with several other panels containing a few cup marks. The most highly decorated panel contains arcs, cups and rings with radials, rosettes and joined cups. Unusually for Kukubisha, some of the panels in this group face southwest. Professor Bradbury from Reading University has analysed the distribution of circular motifs in six areas of Britain and Ireland, and he found that Galloway has a similar distribution as the other areas he studied, West Yorkshire, Dingle, Donegal, Northumberland and Mid-Argyll. Unfortunately, the fieldwork part of the project has ground to a halt during the pandemic. This is the last year of the project, so it is quite likely that the Kukubri team will not have a chance to record many more panels. This is a great pity as there are many more to be done. I imagine some people who are listening are familiar with Ronald Morris's famous 104 ideas as to what rock art means. He listed his suggestions with a score from 10 through to zero to grade the ideas in terms of likelihood, 10 being the most likely, zero being unlikely, for instance. He gives alignment markers, say for the midwinter solstice or, or, or moonrise, a score of 10. Whereas messages from outer space, he gives a score of zero. There are a lot of ideas with a score of around five, such as a code for wise men, no mention of women, for astronomical information, or for use by druids in their ceremonies. Some of us added the 105th reason which involves the recreation of cow pats, perhaps involving a fertility deity. There are some people who think that rock art may represent maps. Slide please. Recently, the BBC reported that a panel of rock art was found in a cellar in Finisterre. It had been excavated in 1900 from a kist burial, placed in the cellar and forgotten about until 2014 when it was refound. A report in the bulletin of the French Prehistoric Society suggested the presence of repeated motifs joined by lines depicted an area of Finisterre. The distribution of motifs suggested it represented a 3D model of an 80 mile stretch of the River O'Day. The BBC quoted Dr Nicholas from Bournemouth University as saying, this is probably the oldest map of a territory that has been identified. Dr Nicholas goes on to say, the central motif may symbolise an enclosure surrounded by three river springs. It was probably a way to affirm the ownership of a territory by a small prince or king at the time. We, ten, we tend to underestimate the geographical knowledge of past societies. This slab is important as it highlights this cartographical knowledge. The piece of rock known as the St. Bellac slab is believed to date from the early Bronze Age between 1900 BC and 1650 BC. Each member of the group has come up with their ideas of what the motifs may mean, although as we recorded the panels, some of the ideas have either changed or been dismissed. One initially thought they might be maps of the heavens, another thinks they may have reflected the transition from nomadic to more settled land use, Others have speculated a more spiritual use or a more magical use. In the Macca's area, which is also covered in rock art, LIDAR shows there are some hut circles 
in areas where the rock art occurs. If anyone wants to see the rock art in Kakubishire, some of the most accessible are the panels at Town Head, the panels at Grange, Newlaw, and of course, High Banks. As many of the Kakubishire panels are situated on the Army Life Fiery Range, which is in frequent use, it is imperative to check with the range officer before visiting those in the Milton, Milton Parks, Dunrod and Balmay area. Um, slide please. There are also some good examples in the Stuartry Museum, not just Hornell's replica. One of our group members was particularly keen to engage the local community with their rock art. Um, slide please and with the help of the Galloway's Glens Landscape Partnership, arranged a field day to High Banks for interested local people. She also did a talk for the National Trust and an interview on Out of Doors for Radio Scotland. More recently, Border Life, a local ITV programme, have done some socially distanced filming at High Banks with a couple of group members. Um, slide, please. In recent years, local farmers have accidentally destroyed some of the rock art panels when levelling the ground for easier, easier silaging. As agricultural practices continue to change, many panels are liable to destruction. For instance, during the past few weeks, a panel near Borg has been damaged by rolling. It seems to me odd that there are few recorded panels beyond the year, so it might be advantageous to undertake field work in the east of the county to check that there has not been a bias in recording. The areas away from the coast need to be more carefully checked as they seem to have been neg neglected in the past, probably because there is a lot of moorland to cover. The landscape of Galloway has inspired artists for thousands of years. Walking around the area, one can find more modern rock art in the landscape. The sculptures, around the Forest Park were commissioned in 1997 to celebrate 50 years of the Forest Park. Gordon Young created the gemstain at Curratry, a sculpture made from Scottish pink quartz. At Glen Kiln, one can see Henry Moore's two-piece reclining figure. Uh, Matt Baker's The Quorn is part of the Tarnoltry Trail near Black Lock and consists of atmospheric and slightly spooky heads amongst the dry stain sheep pens. And I think the children at Kakubri made the standing stone at Bar Hill. The origins of these slides are more enigmatic. Um, slide please. The roughly carved, this roughly carved face is in Curratry. It is highly unlikely to be one of the commissioned sculptures. The pack horse has been carved onto the parapet of the bridge at the Bridge of Dee. The Pictish carvings and some more modern graffiti at Trustees Hill have baffled people for many years. This area was not part of Pickland, so why are they there? The Serpent and Stag from Tor's Cave. Um, the dating of these two carvings remain problematic. They were found in the 70s by a German caver who said that he had hacked them off the wall of the cave. He handed them into the Stuartry Museum and they were then sent to Glasgow to the Keeper of Archaeology at Glasgow Museums and Art Galleries, for his opinion. He thought they were probably genuine and suggested the stag to be possibly Iron Age in date and the serpent to be almost Scandinavian in design and possibly 9th or 10th century. Recent work by John Picken and David Devereux has given a more likely date as the early medieval for the stag and later medieval for the serpent. However, they both could be much more modern and be part of 19th century graffiti, which um, adorns the walls of the inner cave. The little carving of a boat on the parapet of Tongland Bridge, although the bridge has an obvious date stone of 1761, was originally built in 1737. David Collins suggests that she might be a cutter, and this is what he wrote. Basic as it is, it conveys a surprising amount of recognisable detail. The proportions in the carving appear to be accurate and credible, and the mast, sails and spars are all technically correct. The vessel is single-masted, gaff-rigged and is technically a cutter, 
as she appears to have two head saws. A cutter rig almost always has a bowsprit and the second head saw was rigged with its foot at the end of the bowsprit and its head higher up the mast than that of the first head saw. I would guess the vessel depicted to date from the 18th century to the early 20th century. Um, slide please. But there are still modern cup and ring marks to be found. I read that I was supposed to give a humorous talk. So I have finished with two vaguely relevant cartoons. So slide please. On behalf of the Kukubri Rock Art Group, I would like to thank the farmers, landowners and the range officer in allowing us access to the land. <laughs>